Ufka. I didn't have that trouble yesterday morning. Yesterday morning, everything was smooth as can be. But welcome, welcome. And uh, it, so we've got quite a few of you in, uh, here in person, which is nice. And you can all see the screen okay? I see yep. fine. Okay, good. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to start with something that was just, uh, this is something Beth actually found. She says, oh, you might be interested in this. And uh, this will tie back into help you remember a little bit of what we were covering last time. So you know how we talked about in the sequence on creation, we talked about the Fibonacci series and the Fibonacci spiral. Well, Beth came across this uh, thing of humpback whales feeding and they blow bubbles to, and then go around in a circle to, to get the fish and then they come up to the center. But they make a Fibonacci spiral. So, yeah, so uh, we're going to just, there's a, like a one minute video here that we will see here. Oh, but here is where we ended off. We, we talked about, uh, especially in, in Genesis chapter one, uh, it, uh, it says that creation is good. You know, at the end of each day of creation, God says it is good. And at the end of day six, it is very good. So here's the question I ask. If creation is good, what happened? Because I think we could all say, uh, it's not, uh, oh man, it's not, uh, not always good, uh, like what we see around us, right? Like what we see in the world is not always good. There's a lot of bad stuff. So, so that's the question. So that leads us to a discussion on sin. And when I teach uh, my class at Luther, uh, I define sin in a very specific way. Um, trying to avoid religious language. When I ask the students to define sin, um, they will usually say something like uh, breaking God's rules or something like that, right? Um, doing something bad, like that. that's how they'll define sin. But that's actually only a small part of the picture. So here's how I define sin. Sin is an attitude of selfishness or self-centeredness, which leads to harmful and destructive acts towards others and the world. So it's the attitude that leads to the actions that is the problem. So it's the attitude that leads to breaking God's rules. It's the attitude that leads to uh, doing hurtful things to others and so forth. And if you don't change the attitude or if you don't deal with the attitude, uh, you really haven't changed that much, right? So, so sin in this way is regarded as like a condition of humanity rather than just acts of or certain behavior, right? So it's a deeper problem than, well, we just fix this behavior and then we're okay. No, it's a deeper problem than that. And we'll get into this in more detail as we look at uh, Genesis chapter 3, but a little bit more here. What do I mean by selfishness and self-centeredness? So selfishness, um, and what's the difference between the two? Selfishness is intentional in its impact on others. In other words, the person just doesn't care. So, you know, a toddler wants those toys, even though they got their own pile of toys, but they're going to go and they're going to take those toys, and they don't care how it makes the other person feel, the other kid feel, right? The other kid might cry, doesn't matter. I, those are mine, right? Um, that's, that's one example, but there's lots of examples of people who uh, act in a way that they know that it's hurtful or disappointing or whatever to someone else, but that they still want to do that, whatever, whatever that is, okay? That's selfish, selfishness, okay? Self-centeredness I describe as an unintentional uh, attitude uh, in its impact on others. In other words, the person isn't, just isn't aware. So that's when we, we might do things and we don't realize how it's impacting others. So we're not intentionally trying to hurt others, um, it's, it, but it happens anyways because we're, we're acting out of ignorance, we're acting out of, out of this perspective that is only ours. In other words, well, it's not hurting me, it must not be hurting anyone else, right? Like there's that kind of way of thinking. This is good for me, M must be okay for other people. 
So that's self-centeredness. And, uh, and so it, both of those things, I mean, what's linked between both of those things is the concept of self, that this is all coming out of me uh, and, and it's how I'm going to function in the world. But it impacts the world. How I'm going to function in the world will impact the world, whether it's other people or even literally nature, right? Um, so <coughs> I'll give you an example using sort of a modern uh, idea. There are some people who uh, would say, yeah, they're concerned about climate change stuff, um, but they're still... Uh, like they're going to burn as much fossil fuel as they want. Like they know that it's not good, but they want to they want to have their whatever it is, uh, whether it's their trips or their big vehicle or whatever. Like, um, like here's one of the questions I ask myself all the time. Why do we need so many trucks in the city? Like pickups, like lots of people, like on my street, there's guys who've got big pickups. And it's one thing if they're doing it for work, but some of these guys, it's... It's not work. It's just they they want to feel good about what they're doing, uh, or who they are, and they have these big trucks that eat a lot of gas. So that's selfishness. I think that's yours, Mary. And uh, self-centeredness would be not being aware of how gas consumption, the consumption of fossil fuels, is actually damaging the environment. So you're uh, you know you're you're functioning out of uh, you know, well, I, th these are things I want to do. I want to take this trip. I want to have this vehicle or whatever. Um, but you're not aware. Okay? So, so, so you see kind of the difference between the two? But they both have the same impact. Damage is done. And uh, one of the ways that I talk about sin with, uh, with the class at Luther is I'll say, if you want to know if sin is taking place, look for a victim. Look for someone or something that's been hurt. That's, that's the quickest, easiest way. Has someone been hurt? Uh, then, then perhaps sin has taken place. That being said, you can also hurt people by accident or whatever. But yeah, okay. So the effects of sin are broken relationships with each other and ultimately with God. So when we do things that are hurtful to others... Well, that impacts our relationship with them. Whether it's our neighbors, our co-workers, um, the people we encounter uh, on the street or whatever, right? If, uh, if, if I'm acting in a way that's self-centered or selfish, that is going to damage those relationships, break them. And where you see this really clearly um, identified or, or laid out for us, is in Genesis chapter three, so that's where we're gonna that's where we're gonna go next. Okay, so Genesis chapter three, your favorite story and mine, maybe not. Um, I want you just to take a look, skim through chapter three, remind yourself of all the elements of the story. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do this, and then we're gonna talk about the meaning of this story and what it's telling us about our human experience.
How are you doing? Do you want a little more time? Just a little more. Just a bit more, okay. Okay. Uh, hopefully you've had enough just to kind of reacquaint yourself with the story. Mm-hmm. All right, so one of the questions people will ask me is, uh, why, did God, why did God make it possible for humans to, to sin? Like, like what, what's the point of that? Like, it's almost like God created something broken to begin with. So then we uh, get to the question of, you know, I, I see what's going on here. I thought I had saved the... Uh, anyways, all right. Don't worry about it. Free will is the word I want you to look at there. Okay, free will. So, free will is... Oh, I know. I know what I did. I used the wrong USB stick. I used the one from yesterday. That's what's... So, let me just... I'm going to... Because otherwise it's going to drive me nuts. Hang on. <laughs> So uh, while I'm doing this, you, I, you, we can still talk about things. Um, what is it about free will, do you think, that is important enough that God would risk giving humans free will? And what do I mean by free will? So let's start with that. What do I mean by free will? Yeah, choice. Like humans have the ability to choose, right? We can choose between this and this. And we can do so in a way that is um, not uh, forced, or like it truly is, of our own volition, of our own free will. Did that, uh, did that do its thing? Did it go on there properly? Let's find out. All right. Well, since I've got it, here's the Fibonacci whales. Here they come this minute. So that's the air bubbles, and then watch in the middle now. Here comes the whales. There's two of them. So until we had the ability to use drone photography, that was never spotted before. So it is a feeding pattern that they use, but you have to have, you know, you have to look right down on them from above in order to spot it. So as a person who was doing uh, studies of humpback whales who caught this with their drone camera. Anyways, there you go. So now, everything is going to be good now. Here we go. Free will. All right. Free will. So here's the thing about free will. Why free will is important. Because without free will, relationships are meaningless. Because if I, for example, if I program my computer to say when I boot it up, oh, Dennis, you're the greatest guy in the world and I really love you and I really like working with you, that would not make me feel any better on any given day, right? Because I programmed it to say that, right? You know, or if, um, you know, when, my, when our kids were little, if Beth said, you go and tell dad that you love him, and I overhear that, and then the kid comes in and goes, dad, I love you. Okay, <laughs> it means nothing, right? But 
if the child comes to me on their own and just says that, and, and there doesn't appear to be any ulterior motive, they're just saying it, then it means a whole lot, right? So for relationships to have meaning, free will has to exist. And since God seems to be most interested in relationship, and we were talking about that in terms of the Trinity stuff, then free will needs to exist. But free will means the possibility of somebody choosing in a way that you wouldn't want them to choose. That's the risk that you take with that. So it's necessary for a relationship to mean anything. And, uh, and so in this story, like I, I would have students say, why did God put that tree in the middle when, when God just said, you know, you can't eat from the fruit of that? that like what, what is the whole point of that? The whole point of that is you need actual choices. Like there needs to be choices that are viable and maybe even, you know, uh, something appealing about them. So, so options must exist for free will to exist. If you don't have options, then there's nothing to choose. And if you don't have anything to choose, then free will doesn't need to be exercised. So, so the, the first thing to know about this story is that it's a story about human free will, right? Uh, but that's really only scratching the surface because the next thing we can talk about is temptation. Because seem, things seem to be going just fine until the tempter shows up. And then the tempter, you know, introduces some elements into the story in, in the conversation with Eve. And I wonder if you can identify what elements are being introduced into the situation. What is the tempter introducing? Doubt is one. Perfect. Doubt is one. Um, and and who, who is being doubted? God. First of all, the serpent says, did God really say you can't eat the fruit from any tree in the garden? Which the serpent knows is not really what he's going for, right? And Eve defends God and says, oh, no, no, God didn't say that. God said we, sh we can eat it from any tree except for this one. Then comes the doubt, right? Oh, yeah. Well, that's because God knows that if you eat of that, then you, you know, blah, blah, blah. In other words, God doesn't have your best interest in mind. Don't you know what, you, what is good for you? Well, you should know what's good for you. Don't, don't let God, God, you can't trust God, right? Like that's what's being introduced, those questions, right? So doubt is being introduced, and one other feature that also begins with the letter <coughs> D. What do you think that is? Uh, you could say deceit is certainly in there, because deceit is happening, absolutely happening. But in terms of Eve and her reaction to what's going on, when the serpent you know, tells her the story and whatever, then Eve looks at the tree and what? She sees the fruit and sees? She desires, she desires it. So, so what we have here <laughs> is an elements of doubt and desire being introduced into the picture. So, uh, so things seem to be going okay until doubt and desire uh, enter the picture. So paradise, Eden, is portrayed as this place that has everything that humans need. It has beauty, it has variety, it has food, it has a shelter, assumingly, like you can sit in the shade of the tree if the sun is too hot or whatever, right? But now... Eve begins to think, oh, maybe there's something that's missing, right? And whenever we start comparing, then we get into trouble. Like, what, what am I missing? What, does somebody have something that I don't have and so on and so forth, right? <clears throat> oh, I would like that. There's no surprise that in the Ten Commandments, they end with basically commandments that talk about don't be desiring stuff that isn't yours or coveting, right? Because that attitude leads to all these other things, right? All right. So there's also an appeal to selfishness and self-centeredness here. So, uh, so the appeal uh, in the temptation is, is what? Like, like, why would Eve want to do this, according to uh, you know, what the serpent has told her? 
Why would Eve want to eat this fruit? What's what's in it for her? Knowledge. Okay, have knowledge of good and evil and be like God, right? Okay. So, a couple of points here. Um, uh, let's start with knowledge of good and evil, right? This is a common human malady. We have it all the time, and that is we are the ones who decide what is good and what is bad. We are judgmental, in other words. We decide what people are good and what people are bad. We decide what's good for me and what's bad. And sometimes it's, it's, it's not a problem, but other times it can cause a lot of problems, right? But we like to be the ones who decide what's good and what's bad, right? Because we want to decide what's good and what's bad based on what's good for me and what's bad for me. And that's self-centeredness, right? And then selfishness is sort of like, well, you can be like God. So you don't need God. You can, you can just do whatever you want. And you don't have to worry about anything else. You just do your own thing. So, so that's uh, what's really going on here. Like the temptation is not that the fruit looks so great that Eve said, you know, that, that probably tastes different and better than anything else. That isn't at all. The, I mean, it describes it as being, she looks at it and says, well, it looks good to eat or whatever. But the real temptation that's going on here is you can be like God. You don't need God anymore because you can be your own God, right? And, uh, and you, will, you can know what, what is good and what is evil. Now, the irony is when she eats it, she actually does gain the knowledge of good and evil because she now has, oh, I did something that was against God's will. So, so she did get that knowledge, but she doesn't have all knowledge. All right, one more thing that we're going to talk about, and that is the serpent. Here's the question. Why does this story use a serpent uh, as, as the image of the tempter? Why do you think the serpent is chosen for that? If you, okay, go ahead. Like yeah. Ah, very good. Yeah. Right, it's the way the serpent moves, right? They kind of, they don't come at you straight forward, right? They kind of weave around, and uh, and you never quite know where they're coming from. Now, I know you're a big snake lover here, so, so uh, you know, just take this with a grain of salt, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> but, but it is true that serpents move differently than in almost any other creature, right? And so you never quite know, and that's exactly describing what happens here. Because the first question the tempter asks is, uh, you know, seems like an innocent question. Did God really say? I just want to clarify, right? And so it seems like this is a, uh, this is a, a thing about clarifying what God said, right? That's pretty innocent. He goes, oh, no, 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 this is what God said. You, you, you didn't get the memo. So here's the memo. This is what God said. Right, but that's not really what's going on. That's just the initial movement, and then now you get the sideways attack, which is, oh no, well that's because God knows, you see. So, so that's how temptations often function. They don't always come at us head on, right? They sometimes sneak in sideways, and that's what actually makes them difficult to deal with because they aren't coming head on. The head on temptations are actually in some ways more easy to deal with, right? Because we can steal ourselves for, no, I'm not going to do that. But it's the ones that kind of sneak in, right? So, I'll give you an example uh, from history. World War, beginning of World War II, you know, uh, the Nazis come to power in Germany. And, uh, and initially, right, it's like people say, well, there's some stuff about that Hitler guy, we're not totally, but, but he's good for this. Look at what he's done for our economy. Look what he's done for <coughs> our industry. You know, like, so things are coming in the side and it's not until it's too late that you realize, oh, there's another agenda going on here. See, there's another agenda. And that's, that's how temptation often works. So the serpent has what at first of all seems to be this agenda, but it's not, it's this other one. So I think that weaving is one, okay? 
So anything else you can think of as to why a serpent might be chosen here? Well, I have a question for you. Why did God ever create the serpent? Well, because I think in order for free will to exist, you, you need legitimate choices, or you need choices that seem legitimate. Thus, you need a tempter. You need someone to offer the choice. And that would be, so, so it's a product of necessity, I would say, in terms of, of making an honest choice, or what appears to be an honest choice. Like there's this possibility, and there's this possibility, and someone has to let Eve know there's this possibility. So there's a tempter, right? And so, uh, so, so that's exactly the question, though, that people would ask me. Like, why did God even create this serpent that tempts Eve in the first place? But because you need a choice. You need a choice in order for the relationship to mean anything, right? All right. So, so uh, <coughs> serpents to most people like me, very <coughs> ugly and cause bad feelings. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think uh, someone brought this up yesterday morning too, and that is for most people, or many people, for many people, serpents uh, cause a reaction of fear or, or dislike or something like that. I mean, so that's part of it too. Like it's an animal, like it wasn't a cute kitten. Like a cute kitten, yeah. Yeah, like, like yeah, so. so. Picture of me holding a ball python. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick them off like they're cats. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in case you don't, do you you have you have pet snakes, right? We don't. No, I have to pick between a pet snake and a husband, unfortunately. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So Eric had a good collection of stuffed snakes when he was little because he's on Team Snake. Okay. And the kids are on Team Snake, but Sid is not. Sid is not. Is not a, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. But I know you like snakes. I love and them. and you like snakes too, Eric. All right. Okay. And it was, we're not trying to pick on snakes, but what we are trying to do is figure out why this was said here. So I think one of the things is, I would say the majority of the population would have some kind of negative, um, you know, sense of snakes. But there's something even more uh, insightful here, I think, that we can come to. And that is, not all, but most, many snakes, many snakes, certainly the snakes that were around in that region, right, are poisonous. And so I think it is also a symbol of a poisoned relationship. What the serpent has done is poisoned the relationship between humans and God. And so it's a symbol of a poisoned relationship. And that's exactly what goes on here. Like, like the serpent, by introducing these temptations, is poisoning the relationship between uh, well, actually, not just between the humans and God, but even between the humans themselves, between Eve and Adam. That, and we see how that plays out. Well, let's, let's in fact, let's move into that. So r the relationships are broken by this choice that is made there. And how do we know that relationships are broken? The first thing is that we're told that, that uh, Adam and Eve become aware that they're naked and they go into hiding. So both of those things indicate that there is, they don't want to be seen for who they are, right? They've got something to cover up, in other words. Right? They've got something to cover up. And uh, so I think the nakedness here is not necessarily, some people would say that it's talking about sexual innocence and stuff like that. I, I think uh, that's over, uh, being overly specific. I think it's more general than that. It's, I think it's just this sense that like when we wear clothing, it's, it's to cover up things that we want to keep private. So we even call them our private parts or whatever. Or we want to, you know, like let's say you got a scar somewhere and you don't want people to see your scar. So you're, I'm going to wear a long sleeve shirt all the time so nobody sees my scar or whatever it is. We use clothing to cover up stuff that we don't want others to see, right? And that's exactly what's going on here. Adam and Eve need to cover up. Or, or they know, they recognize now, oh, we've got something we want to hide. So they literally go into hiding and they're aware of their nakedness, right? So, so that's the, the relationship between God and them is symbolized by that, right? Okay, but then we have other ways that the, the broken relationship is symbol, uh, recognized as well. Uh, Adam blames Eve. So God, you know, in discussion with Adam, 
Adam, uh, he says, well, well what, what did, how did you know you were naked? Well, the woman you gave me, <laughs> right? You know, she, she gave me this fruit and I, and I ate of it. What? And so then, uh, so Adam blames Eve. What does Eve say? Well, the serpent that you made, basically, that's the inference. The inference is, it's, well, it's your fault, God. If the serpent wasn't there, this wouldn't have happened. It's, it's your fault. Uh, so nobody's taking responsibility for for they're functioning out of what? Uh, well, well, the guilt I think is in there, but what are they functioning out of? Self centeredness. No, it's not my not not me. I'm not the problem. That's the problem out there. That's the problem, not here, right? So, and of course, as soon as we start doing that, then. You, you are damaging relationships because you're, you know, you're making other people be accountable for something that's actually something that's your responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. All right. Doesn't it enrich the free will towards God? <clears throat> you know, because then like, you have a choice. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's not blind, yeah. obedient. Yeah, yeah. So it enriches that whole experience with God. Well, the reconciliation, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, Mary, but now there's the possibility of reconciliation. And reconciliation can be a very meaningful experience, right? But I would say that they had a meaningful and rich experience with God prior to this even. I mean, the choice was there, and they were ignoring making the wrong choice until the temptation came along. And then, and then they're offered a choice that's really a choice, and then, yeah, so, so it's really clarifying what are the choices that we have in life. Yeah? Yeah. I keep thinking about our acts. Like, they can be deceitful. They have some free will. You know, how we are different from animals. You know, but animals have some of these traits. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, this is not exclusive to humans, right? You know, but I think, I think animals... Uh, function maybe more instinctually more often than humans. I think humans function instinctually too, quite often. So, all right. Now, the other way we know relationships are broken is that they're banished from Eden. So no longer are they in the presence, like Eden is pictured as a place where they walk and talk with God, Mm -hmm. right? But now they can't be there anymore. And life is going to be filled with pain. And that is actually describing human life. Because for most of human history, life has been suffering. Like we in the 20th and 21st century um, have less suffering than previous generations. But boy, like if you were like if you were to live in the Middle Ages, tough, hard, hard life, hard life. And there was a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And and so when when uh, this story tells us that you know the humans are uh, removed from paradise. I mean, people would recognize that and go, "Yeah, we're not in paradise anymore." So uh, Joni Mitchell uh, has a famous line in the song. And what's the line about this? We've got to get back to the garden again. Now, th- that was it's also I think it's from the song Woodstock. Um, a- anyways. There is a sense in which humans are longing for that paradise again that we lost. In fact, so then that's the name of a you know a famous book that used to be studied in English all the time, Paradise Lost. Who is that? Milton. Who wrote Paradise Lost? Yeah, what was his first name? Anyways, it doesn't matter. So the uh, banishment from Eden. Is a is a symbol uh, or a recognition of this relationship that's broken. So now, the very next thing that happens after Genesis three. Now you didn't look at this, but the very next thing that happens shows us what happens now that humans have given into self centeredness and selfishness. What happens when that is taken to an extreme? So in in Genesis four, do you know what happens? What's the very next story after Adam and Eve leave the garden? Cain and Abel, right? Cain and Abel, Genesis chapter 4. And what happens there? 
sin leads to fratricide, that is the murder of a brother. And for not really a particularly good reason. Seems like maybe jealousy is going on here um, or something else, but it's not like, you know, the one was threatening the life of the other or something like that. But, but you know, the anger or the, or the sense of, well, comparison. Well, you're being treated differently than me or whatever, and so then that, that's, that self-centeredness and that selfishness, you know, can, when taken to extremes, can lead to the ultimate breaking of a relationship, which is death, right? And uh, interestingly, Cain asks this question. So uh, uh, God says, where's your brother? And uh, Cain goes, oh, am I my brother's keeper? And for the Jewish people, they would know the answer. The answer is, yes, you are your brother's keeper. That's how this is supposed to be. And, um, and so, uh, you know, Cain is showing complete disregard, complete self-centeredness. Hey, uh, my, my brother is no concern of mine. I, at the same time, he's being deceitful which is ironic because he's being deceitful towards God who knows everything, right? So, so it's also showing us a lack of awareness of what are my human limitations versus God's limitations, right? Uh, and so Cain functions out of this way that allows him to do this terrible thing. Now, uh, this leads me to an interesting thing that happens periodically to me. Uh, you know, I'll be doing a service, maybe a funeral service or something, like that, and there's people there who who don't come to church um, or very seldom come to church, whatever, and they'll be in the building, and then they'll be talking with somebody else, and then they'll swear, and, and I'm in the presence, like they, I'm there. And then they'll turn to me and immediately go, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And I want to say to them, you don't have to apologize to me, you know. But the funny thing is, is that... They could be out in the parking lot or they could be somewhere else and they could say the same words and they would think there's no problem with that. But somehow they think in this building, God notices more or something. Like, I'm not sure what they're thinking, but then they'll, they'll issue that apology. And it's like, no, no, it's like God is everywhere. So it's kind of like, kind of like Cain saying, well, I can get away with this. God doesn't know what happened. No, God knows what happened. And... Uh, and so the irony is, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is, yes, you are, but you, you haven't been, right? You haven't been. <coughs> so Who is your brother? Is it like just all people? Like, am I the keeper of all people that I know? Or is it my brother? Well, it, 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 I would say that the answer to that comes a little later when Jesus is asked a similar question, who is my neighbor? Oh. And his answer is, whoever you come across, who's in need, right? Like the guy beat up, like that's when he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, right? In answer to that question. And so the answer is, our neighbors or our brothers or our sisters are anyone that, that we are in connection with in some way or another. Whether there's a blood relationship or not, that's not the point. So all humans, all humans are our brothers and sisters. Okay. Is the way I would put that, Shirley. All right, so... If, so now we've been introduced to the problem, okay? The problem is sin exists in the world. So how are we going to get back to the original intended um, uh, basis for creation? That is, that creation is good. How is that going to happen? How will creation be restored to its good nature? And the answer to that comes much later in the history of, <coughs> so many, many generations after the story of Adam and Eve, and so way, way past Abraham and Sarah, way past David and Bathsheba, way, it's this, <coughs> the incarnation. <coughs> so the answer of how is creation going to be restored is that the creator will come into the midst of creation as one of us will suffer alongside us, will even die, but then will be resurrected, and that will be the beginning of a new creation. 
and through faith we are connected with Christ in such a way that we are part of that new creation that is beginning. And in fact, in 2 Corinthians, there is a passage that says literally, uh, in Christ we are a new creation. So, so this idea of new creation um, is not just for some future time. It's already breaking into the world. It's been breaking into the world since the time of Christ. And we, as, as followers of Christ, have a responsibility of continuing that work, that restorative, that uh, redemptive um, uh, work in the world. Um, and one of the reasons why that's important is because there are some who will talk about um, heaven as being the ultimate um, goal for Christians to the point where uh, they're so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good, right? So in other words, they, they say, well, there was, there was a congressman from Minnesota many years ago during the nuclear arms buildup. Um, who said, oh, we don't have to worry about this because uh, uh, Jesus is going to return and this world is going to be no more and we'll all be taken off. And so basically he was saying, we can do whatever we want with this world, which is totally misreading what, what God has asked us to do, right? We are stewards of this world and that this world is actually where the new creation will be how that exactly looks and how exactly that works. Um, uh, another way of putting it is that what will happen in the end of time is that this world and heaven will be rejoined. Okay? And Eden was kind of a picture of that. Eden was a picture of where heaven and earth were connected in such a way that God could walk with humans, humans could walk with God, there was peace, there was abundance. So you think of the pictures that we, some of the pictures we have from scriptures that talk about that time, that kingdom to come, and what it'll be like. Well, the lion will lie down with the lamb, right? So you have a picture of, of, of nature that, that is peaceful, right? You don't have predators anymore because they, I don't know, everyone turns into herbivores or something. I'd like, but there, there is a sense in which that, that, like the images that were given is images that are from this planet, um, not just, uh, well, in fact, the images of heaven that we often have, the, the idea of clouds and, and flying around with wings and stuff like that, th there's only a few spots in scriptures that could even get us thinking that along that line. Most of the images that are given are images of this world being rejuvenated in some way, right? So that it returns to the good of creation initially, right? When God said it is good, that's, that's where we're heading. So, so that's why we need a savior. So that leads us now back to the creed, okay? So you may be wondering, are we ever gonna get back to the creed? Well, here we are. Let me stop and ask if anyone has any questions or comments at this point. For those of you online here, if you have a question or a comment, just unmute yourself and, and just speak. So, anyone in the room? Question, comment? Beth? Yeah, that's, that's very insightful. Yeah, it is. It's like the one garden leads to the other garden which leads to the renewed garden, right? Yeah. So the humans are removing God from the garden in Gethsemane. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating how that garden imagery works in Scripture and the fact that Jesus, just before his execution, you know, is in, in the garden and has the ultimate victory. What is the ultimate victory that we see from Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane? It has to do with choice. Yeah, he, he, thy will. Like he, Your will be done, exactly. Not my, not my self-centered will, yeah. not my selfish will, but your will be done. That's the victory. Yeah, 
And, and, so, and so there's an echo of the Garden of Eden being reversed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Like it's, it's, the more you dig into this stuff, the more amazing it is. And you have, or I have anyways, I've come to a deeper respect for the, the people who put the biblical material together. Because, you know, the, over the centuries, these stories were, you know, put together and stuff like that. But there was an awareness of how this all fits together and a, a story arc that goes through the whole thing, right? Even though they were written, the different books were written in different eras and by different authors, there is a story arc that goes through the whole thing that, that, ends, with, that ends with the new creation. Where do you see that? Where is the new creation in its final form? Where do we see that? What book? Revelation. Revelation. In the end of Revelation. So you go from the, the first creation in Genesis 1 to the new creation in Revelation 21. And, and then this story arc that takes us there. With, with the hero coming in the middle to rectify the problems that humans cannot rectify, which is Jesus. Right? And, and we'll get into this more. Okay. But then with Jewish people who, you know, learn the same story of, of creation and that, and, and they can see the fall that, that you know, what, what we learn from there, from that story. So they're still waiting for a Messiah, waiting for that, like, what where we see in Jesus, they're still yeah. waiting for yeah, and and the, and the tricky thing here too, of course, is to recognize that even within Judaism, there's there's wide diversity. So there would certainly be some who would be saying, "Yeah, no, we're still waiting for the Messiah." There would be others who would interpret what the coming Messiah is supposed to mean. But they are most of them would would talk about the day of the Lord, which is this day to come where all things will be set right. Like that would be they would. You know, and it, <coughs> so where does the Messiah come? When? You know, is it, is it at the very end when it's the day of the Lord? Or is it sometime before that leading into the day of the Lord? Like those would be things that, that they would have differences of opinions on. But they still recognize the need for that. Yeah, there's a recognition. Yeah. 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 I have a feeling that sometimes there's a belief of more than one Messiah to do different things. Uh, it, it, you know, it, yeah, in a sense. Because their whole history right, was filled with God sending leaders at different times to take care of different situations, whether it be kings or, or judges or prophets, right? God would send someone and, and, give, and give the Holy Spirit to that person to enable them to accomplish what it was, whether it was prophetic speech or it was, you know, uh, good military leadership or whatever it might be, yeah. So, so there is a sense, I think, it's, it's certainly certain factions of Judaism that it, that it wouldn't be there is a Messiah, like only one, but there are the Messiahs that we need, God will send when we need them, kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 How you guys doing? Hanging in there? Online? You guys doing okay? Dad, you falling asleep? <laughs> No, okay, just checking, just checking, just checking. All right, here we go. We're going to get into the creed. So now we're getting to, um, uh, we'll be getting to the second article. But where we're going to go first is just to talk about creeds. So the word creed comes from the Latin word credo, which means most simply stated, I believe. So because our creed begins, I believe, that's how it gets the name credo or creed. And... Um, and the literal meaning, however, of the word credo, the literal meaning is this. I give my heart, or I set my heart towards. So it's the language of the heart, a profound expression of commitment, not simply a list of statements to which one gives intellectual assent. This has been the problem ever since the Protestant Reformation, is that we have turned faith into an intellectual exercise rather than a way of whole life, right? So do you agree with these? You can go to almost any Christian uh, organization's webpage and they will somewhere on their webpage have a statement of faith and they will list the doctrines that they 
agree with, right? But it's almost like it's an intellectual exercise. Do you, can you agree with all these things? Check the boxes. Okay, then you can belong to our group or whatever. And that intellectual assent, there's nothing wrong with intellectual assent, but it goes beyond that. That's the point that, that I'm making. It goes beyond that. It should change the way we live, right? So I can talk intellectually about all kinds of things. Like, like I could take a political system, I could take communism, and I could debate its good points and its bad points and whatever. But unless I intend to actually live in a communist uh, state or create one here, um, I'm not actually, it's not actually changing anything, right? It's just an intellectual exercise. Um, and, and so that's where we're trying to move past um, the, creed, the creed as just an intellectual statement. Now, the English dictionary, uh, the couple that I looked up, give this sense of creed as more than just a, a statement of intellectual ideas. So, for example, Merriam-Webster says it's a guiding belief or principle. So guiding in terms of how I live my life, right? It's a principle about how I function in the world, right? That's what my creed is. Or the Cambridge Dictionary says, a set of beliefs that influences the way you live. So, how does this work for Christianity? If we say that we believe that Jesus is Lord, which is right in the creed, second article begins, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, right? That should have an implication as to how we live, right? It should... It should the, the implication is that if we say that, yes, we believe Jesus is Lord, well, what is, what is Lord? And we'll get into that a little more later. But how does that, how do I live based on that? What difference does that make in my life? There should be a difference, right? Okay. So, um, this idea of I set my heart towards is actually found in a number of places in Scripture. So, I'm going to put up four... <coughs> scripture passages here and we're going to look these up briefly and just see examples of both positive and negative setting your heart towards something that's positive and setting your heart towards something that's negative so here are the four first samuel 7 3 and 4 psalm 62 verse 10 the wisdom of solomon which you may or may not have in your bible because it's an apocryphal book um, and then uh, one more that we'll look at afterwards, which is from the Gospel of Luke. But let's start with these three. So take a moment to look, look it up. Did you find it? All right. I'm going to read out of uh, my uh, translation here. I'm going to read these verses. Just follow along in your Bible. So this is 1 Samuel 7, 3 and 4. Then Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the asterisks from among you. Direct your heart or set your heart to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So Israel put away the Baals and the Estarts and they served the Lord only. All right, so in this case, the people of Israel setting their hearts towards God results in what kind of behavior? What do they do? Yeah, they stop worshiping the, these other gods. Okay, they get rid of the idols. So it has an impact on how they live, right? And so they set their hearts towards God. Well, of course we can't have these gods now because we've set our heart towards the Lord. Okay? Kind of follow? 
Yeah? All right, go to the Psalm passage. Psalm 62, verse 10. So this is an example of a negative, right? So here's my translation. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. So what's being said here? What's being, uh, what are people setting their hearts towards? Well, yeah, it, it, it is out of greed. Yeah, it is out of greed, Eric. Yeah. Material things? Yeah, material things, and even we can even make it simpler than that. Just quite simply, what's one thing that everyone wants more of? Money. money. Right? So if you put your heart towards money, right, if that's what you set your heart towards, what can it lead to? Oh, it can lead to extortion and robbery even right because if that is your goal then you might say well out of your self-centeredness or selfishness i'll get that money however i can even if it means extortion or improper business practices which is another thing that's condemned in, in scripture or whatever right so that's an example of setting your hearts towards something that leads to negative consequences, right? All right, the wisdom of Solomon, I doubt most of you have that in your, in your Bibles. You'd have to have the, the, the Catholic version of the Bible, right? Do you have it there? Okay, yeah, so, so I mean, we do. Martin Luther said, you know, these books are fine. Uh, they just weren't necessary. Uh, so, so some Bibles, all right, anyways, here's, here's, I'll put it on the screen for you. Set your mind on the Lord in goodness. Seek him with a sincere heart. So this is the be very beginning, the first verse of the first chapter of the Wisdom of Solomon, which is then going to say, what is the smart way to live, basically? And right here, off the top, we get set your mind or set your heart on the Lord and seek him with a sincere heart. So right off the top. That's, that, will, that will aim your life in a direction that is beneficial. And so what you see in the wisdom literature of scriptures, whether it's in the book of Psalms or the book of Ecclesiastes or here in the wisdom of Solomon, um, you will see that if, if a person seeks after God and God's will first, then, then all these other things will fall into place in terms of what makes life meaningful, what makes life uh, appropriate, and so on and so forth. Not necessarily what makes life easy, you know, because it, it doesn't necessarily make life easy. Sometimes the easier thing to do is to cheat or be self-centered or whatever, right? All right, here's the last one. This is from the Gospel of Luke. Luke 12, <laughs> 29 to 31. <clears throat> so these are Jesus' words. <laughs> Twenty-nine to thirty-one. So, in in some ways, this is Jesus sort of saying the same thing as wisdom of Solomon, right? So, here's my translation. And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that strive for after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for or set your heart towards, depending on your translation, uh, God's kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. So Jesus is saying, first of all, God knows, because you're human, there are certain things you need. You need food and shelter. You don't have to worry that God isn't aware of that. So instead, if you're going to set your heart towards something, set your heart towards God's kingdom. And then these other things will fall into place. 
And so then some people in history have made an extreme uh, example of this. Like, like they have followed this as fully as possible. And one of them is Francis of Assisi. So Francis of Assisi you know, came from a middle-class family, uh, the Nouveau Riche. Um, his father was a merchant, cloth merchant. And, uh, and so he, he looked to have a comfortable life, as comfortable as you can have in the, in the 12th century. And, um, and, but he turns his back on all of it, and he, he literally refuses to own anything other than the simple, very simple rough garb that he wore. So then how did he live? Well, he lived just fine. People gave him food when he needed food. And, uh, and you know, they slept. Uh, they had very simple, well, eventually they built simple monasteries, but it was really simple and whatnot. He had what he needed. Um, but, boy, most of us could not go to that extreme. It's like, well, hold it. I need a little more than just a really rough house and, and one article of clothing. I need a little more than that. But that was Francis. So Francis is an example of the fulfillment of this passage, you know. Was so, he, um, <coughs> was he a, a nature person? Yeah, yeah. So, so with Francis, uh, he saw God active in nature not that god was nature but god was active in nature and so then he's the one who famously talked about different aspects of nature as being his brother and his sister so brother brother son sister moon um the different animals and stuff that was so he has canticle it's called canticle of the creatures is a poem that he wrote a poem prayer near the end of his life and the very end of it he he calls death his sister sister death and, and, he, and he praises God for all these things, including Sister Death, which is, it's a very powerful poem. So yeah, a lot of, like Francis of the bird bath is sometimes what people say, a lot of bird baths have Francis because he preached to the birds, um, is the story. And the birds listened. All right, so now uh, we know what a creed is. So now, uh, where did the creeds come from? The first formally acknowledged Christian creed is the Nicene Creed, which was formulated at the Council of Nicaea, and I spelled Nicaea wrong, I see, in 325. So, the Council of Nicaea, let me just explain what that was. So, Christians uh, had the worst persecution, faced the worst persecution, in the very beginning of the 4th century, so starting right around the year 300, okay? And it was started by an emperor named uh, Diocletian. And his goal was to stamp out Christianity and use the power of the empire to do that. And so it was a bloody affair. This was the worst persecution they faced, and it was empire-wide. Diocletian dies after about uh, five years, and his assistant takes over Galerius, and he continues the policy. But by 311, he realizes for all that they've been trying, they're not succeeding at all. And so Galerius kind of says, oh, all, all right, we'll stop the persecution. Um, yeah? Why were they trying to stamp out Christianity at that point? Were they like frightened that it was small? Yeah, yeah they, they could see. Well, okay, so here's, here's one of the problems. Christians would call Jesus Lord, but that word was kind of reserved for the emperor because it's a political term, really. Um, it's saying the ultimate ruler, right? And so then, uh, and, and this, the way that Christians talked about God, like the Romans had a pantheon of gods, but Christians said, no, there's only one God, and all these pantheons, they're all false gods. So if, if Christians came along and said, well, we have another God to add to the group, then the Romans probably would have said, well, that's fine then. But it's the fact that the Christians said, no, we worship Christ exclusively, and that we see Christ as the ultimate authority, and we do not recognize the divinity of these other gods and or the emperors, because some of the Roman emperors actually saw themselves as divine. They were God, or a god. And, uh, and so for all those reasons, Christianity was a threat. So those two men you mentioned, were they Romans? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Diocletian and Galerius are Roman, Roman emperors. And they tried to stamp out Christianity. 
Yep, yep. The one is that there are some governors who didn't follow that because the Christians were taking care of the poor and the sick. Well, that, that yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what I heard from, like, it wasn't always across the board. It, it, it wasn't always across the board until 300. Then it was, it was empire-wide policy. So prior to that, persecution was uh, sporadic and regional. So it might flare up here and flare up there, but it wasn't empire-wide. This, this is the first time that it's empire, well, actually the first time it was empire-wide was in the year 250, and that was Decius, but that didn't last very long. Prior to these Constantine, Roman as well? yeah, these are all Roman emperors, I'm throwing these names out at you like you know them. Come on, you know these guys, Decius and Diocletian and Galerius and Nero and, yeah. Um, uh, what happens is, uh, uh, well, how can I put this? Yeah, so it's, it's sporadic, it's not consistent and whatever. Um, and there's some recognition that the Christians actually do good in some places because there might be a plague come through a region and all the city people would move out into the countryside, at least the wealthy ones, move out into the countryside to get away from getting the plague, but the Christians were encouraged to stay in the city and care for the sick, even if it, that meant that they caught the plague themselves. And so then some of the emperors, or, uh, not always emperors, but some of the it's governors, not about the governors, the governor, some of the governors would say, man, you know, if, if more people acted like the Christians, we'd have a better society. So there was recognition of that. But, uh, but uh, Diocletian and Galerius, they also thought that the, that the Roman pantheon of gods were getting angry with them and that they would lose their power and status in the world as an empire because the gods would turn on them because they were following this new god. That was another and aspect to it. the height of the Roman Empire, too. Pretty well it's the height. Quite substantially, yeah. it's yeah. huge. Yeah. So, so when you look at, at the map, now, but, but there's infighting. So prior to Constantine, and this is where we're trying to get to, it's Constantine here. Prior to Constantine, um, in the 50 years leading up to Constantine, there have been 22 emperors, and most of them had died violently by assassination. So it was very politically unstable. Um, so actually, the, sort of the pinnacle prior to Constantine you, you almost have to go into the, uh, the second century, but the third century was awful. And then, um, and then you get Diocle uh, sorry, you get Constantine comes to power, and one of the first things he does is he issues the Edict of Milan, which makes Christianity a legal religion. It's now legally, and so all persecutions are over for good. It's not the official religion of the empire, but it's officially recognized by the empire. Mm. Then, uh, at this point, the empire is split into two. There's the east and the west, and, and Constantine is in po uh, takes power in the west. But by the year 325, he also takes power in the east, and the empire is reunited as one empire once again. And then Constantine is emperor for a number of decades. Like, he is, I would say, the pinnacle of the empire in terms of stability and strength and so on and so forth. But Constantine needed... Christianity to be a good cement that would unify the empire together. <laughs> like it'd be one, one of the forces. So because Christianity was spread throughout all the empire, and it already had an organization, it was already had developed into an institution, Constantine saw that as, here's a good opportunity to use, but the Christians have to be unified in order for this to be a unifying force. So they weren't unified in some things, like... When do we celebrate Easter? That wasn't unified. Different regions celebrated Easter at different times. So that was the reason that Constantine says, now you think about this, this is within 12 years of the worst persecution that the Christians had ever faced. Constantine says, hey, I want all the bishops from all over the empire to come to Nicaea and we're gonna have a meeting. Like that would be bizarre, right? That would be bizarre. And I'm gonna pay for everyone's expenses. So that's what happened. He paid for all the expense of all the bishops to come from all over the empire. They gathered in a seaside resort town called Nicaea. It's in modern-day Turkey. Um, and then they were going to have this meeting. And they do, in fact, hammer out the date of Easter, how we're going to celebrate Easter. And it becomes the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. That's what they arrive at. Okay, all right. 
But that's not where they end, because they also get into stuff about the Trinity and how do we understand this. And, and they develop a creed. And the creed then sets forth what it is that we believe about God, um, and particularly in contrast with some of the, um, the different ideas about the Trinity. So the Nicene Creed sought to establish a unified understanding of the Trinity, and specifically the nature of Jesus Christ, because there was the problem. Is Jesus God or not? Well, if Jesus is God, and there's also God the Father, does that not mean that there's two gods? But you, you claim this is a monotheistic religion. Well, how can that be? So they have to work this out, and that's what they're trying to work out. And so then the creed sets it forth uh, in a way. Now, that's the Nicene Creed, but we're going to the Apostles' Creed here. Why? Because it's shorter and simpler. Um, but where did the Apostles' Creed come from then? The Apostles' Creed, which is named not because the Apostles wrote it, but because it agrees with apostolic teaching, right? It was originally formed for liturgical use in baptism. And that explains why the text uses the singular I instead of we I believe versus the Nicene Creed, which says we believe, right? Because this is how it worked for baptisms. And some of you who took my baptism retreat, you know this already. Right, so the, uh, the people who wanted to be baptized in those days, they would go through a period of training, the, 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 basically kind of like confirmation, except older, and it was called, the, uh, the cate- they were called catechumenates. Uh, once they'd gone through that training, which happened in Lent, that was the season of Lent, then on Easter morning, they were baptized. They were led into the baptistry, they would go down into the water, and the bishop would ask them three questions. Do you believe in God? And their response was, they were taught this now, because they had just been taught the creed, the response was, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, so on and so forth. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, and so on and so forth. These were answers to the questions, and that's how the Apostles' Creed took its shape, right? What's also interesting to recognize is that these were sort of three affirmations of what, what we are setting our hearts toward, and they were paired with three renunciations of what we are turning away from. So we're renouncing evil and sin. So there was, th- and in fact, in some cases, you literally, they, they included spitting. And you, and you turned one direction, you turned to the West, mm-hmm. and that was when you were renouncing evil. Why the West? Anybody? you think why why would when they're doing the renunciation of evil and sin why would they face the west that's that's where darkness is because then you turn to the east and that's where the sun rises right so that's why uh, in most churches uh, the altar is at the east end now, that's not always the case, but especially in Europe, the altar is at the east end. Why? Because that's where the light is going to dawn. Like yes, yep, yep, yep. So, uh, so they, they, anyways, that's where the Apostles' Creed comes from. Now, it didn't take its final form, that is, in, in terms of it finally was set down in written form in a way that never changed again until about the 7th or 8th century. But the basic stuff was there right from the third century on. Okay. I love saying it in church with all of us saying it. I just yeah. love that. There's something, um, there's something valuable about saying our faith together, saying what we set our hearts towards together. Then we recognize we're not in this alone. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now let's look at the creed. And, uh, and I'm going to do that with a, uh, a diagram. And I'm going to look at my time here. Okay we're, okay, we're doing okay. Before I start going through this diagram, any questions or comments on the stuff that we've gone through in the last half hour? Well, I'm glad it's being recorded. <laughs> yeah. Because I'll be going back and listening to him. Yeah. There's, uh, there's that was very interesting. A lot of stuff here that I'm throwing at you. Yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah. R- remembering that that uh, when I teach this to Luther, 
some of these things I'm taking days to teach, like 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 numerous classes, right? But you're getting the the high caffeine version or something. Do the Luther kids uh, like them? They're not all Christian in no, Japan. No, no. So how do those non-Christians react to the information you give them? Um, well, first of all, I tell them that, uh, that the reason why it's still valuable to study this, even if you don't believe it, is because uh, Christianity has shaped Western culture. And if you really want to understand Western culture, you have to understand Christianity, right? And that would include even literature. So there was a Canadian by the name of Northrop Fry who said that you cannot understand English literature unless you understand the Bible because so much of English literature draws its themes and its imagery and even some of its language right out of the scripture, right? And so I say, you don't have to believe this, but it, it's valuable to learn this in the same way that when I was in high school, we learned about um, communism, Nazism, and the democracy, um, and, uh, and we had to learn how they formed and what were they were about, because why? That was part of our reality, right? That was part of our world. I, don't, I didn't have to believe in communism, or I didn't have to believe in Nazism, but I had to understand where they came from. You know? And so I think most of them buy that. So you can understand the good from the bad. Well, yeah, 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 that's right. Because I, I would never give in to that temptation, would I? that I'd be the one who judges all good and bad. Um, but let me tell you this one neat story that happened just, uh, well, I guess it was just today. Yeah, it was just today. Because today was the last day of classes for the first semester. So at the end of the class, this one student comes to me and he very, he kind of waits till everyone else has left the room and he comes up and he says kind of quietly, he says, he says, yeah, he says, I want to thank you for this class because it got me going back to church. And he's kind of like, I don't want anyone else to know. He says, it kind of got me going back to church. You know, your one assignment about worship. He says, that's been really good, thanks. I would like to say he was a really good student in class. He wasn't. But, <laughs> but, but if it had a positive impact on him, that's then that's good. So, and they're like 15 to 16 at right? Yeah, yeah they're, they're exactly right then, 15, 16. I had one girl just write her drivers the other day and stuff. So, <coughs> All right. Let's look at this diagram, um, because this diagram I uh, used to explain the creed as a whole. So I'm gonna, you're going to see words pop up on this as we go through this. And uh, so the first thing we say is that the creed tells us that there is one God, but God exists as three persons, okay? So triangles are often used to, to, uh, um, to illustrate the Trinity because of the three sides of the triangle, right? All right. So, the first person of God we've already encountered, which is God the Father, or God the Creator. Now, I've put in gold the, what I'm going to call the relational term, and in white, the vocational term. So, the relational term is like, it indicates some form of relationship, and the vocational terms indicates what that person of God does. So, when we talk about God the Father, primarily in the creed anyways, it says, this is God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth. So that's what God does, or what God did, okay? Second person of the Trinity is God the Son, so there's the relational term, or God the Savior. That's what, that's what Jesus does, saves, okay? And then we get the third person of the Trinity, which is the Spirit, um, or the Sustainer. And now the Spirit is not uh, obviously a relational term, but I think it, it works that way. Now, there's also many other words that could be used for the vocational words for the spirit. Uh, sustainer is one I use, but, you, but also comforter um, is another one. Uh, companion is another one, um, and so forth. So there's a number of words. But now, here are the new words that are unique to the way I do this. So at the top of this chart... I have the words mystery and expansive. So the closer you are to the top of the chart, the more you're dealing in the realm of mystery or expansiveness. This won't make sense at this point, but when we go through it, it'll make more sense. Okay. At the bottom of the chart are the words revealed 
and singular. And again, that won't make much sense until we look at this going on. And then one more thing to add is a timeline. So as you go from left to right, we're going from the past to the future. And as we work through the creed, you will see this. The creed actually is chronological. It works from past through to the future. So that's, um, that's what uh, we've, we've got here. So now we're going to just review quickly the first article, which is about God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. This is just a quick review. So the relational term is Father, and why is that term used? It's a term used to picture God as the one who provides, protects, supports, and mentors like a parent. So how does God provide for us? Yeah, the world, like creation, is here so that we have food and water and shelter and whatever, okay? How does God protect? There's a couple of different ways you can approach this. For ancient Israelites, how might they see that? How did God protect them? Like a shepherd? Yeah, uh, yes, they would call God a good shepherd who protected them from, you know, the, the wolves or whatever, yep, yep. But in terms of their history... Yeah, there's, there's a good example, okay? So, so they were in slavery, God takes them out and, and protects them from the Pharaoh's army, right? And then you have other stories of God protecting them by raising up, you know, leaders, military leaders like David or whatever, um, and so forth. So you have, you have lots of stories of, uh, of how God protects either individuals or the nation or whatever, okay? So they would see that. Here's, I'm going to give you an entirely different way of, of thinking of this protection thing, right? Okay, so why is it that we do not uh, all die from radiation from the sun? Because we have this magnetic... Not all planets have a magnetic core. We have a magnetic field that deflects and whatever, and then we have our atmosphere and so on and so forth. There's things, of, we are protected from the harmful effects of the sun uh, because of the way the world is. So that's a different way of thinking about protection, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so there's different ways. All right, how does God support? How does God support, would you say? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So we can be supported by, by the natural cycles. How, do, how might people feel supported in their life by God? Uh, maybe, let's say, in a difficult time. Through prayer. Yep, could be sensing God's presence through prayer. Right, so people who... Um, I've had a number of people who have told me about being in a difficult circumstance could be because of a health concern or could be because of uh, grief or could be because of you know some other circumstances in their life um, but then having a strong sense of being supported by God or cared for by God being held by God um, and that's what enables them to get through that so there's different ways that people might experience a support right okay and how does God mentor Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we, it's and like mentoring is like teaching or whatever, but giving examples. And God does that in different ways, either by giving leaders, certain leaders, you know, <coughs> um, and, uh, and or giving them things like the law. You know, here's the Ten Commandments, here's, here's how. And then uh, what we could see, we could also say is that then through Jesus, we have the, the best example of what does it mean to live a life in relationship with God. Anyways, those are all ways in which the term father, the relational term father, can make sense, right? So what is not meant by this is there's a guy, a big guy up in the sky with a beard and a deep voice, right? Um, you know, like, I assume most of you have seen Monty Python clips, right? And the animated god is, you know, like this, and the jaw moves and the... 
like I mean, it's it's a it is an image to make fun of because that's really not what this is saying. This is saying something much deeper and more profound than just the big guy in the sky. Though I still have people sometimes say to me, "Well, the big guy in the sky has been nice to me," or something like that. They'll use that terminology. But do you know what? By the way, do you know what the first cosmonaut who went into space, like the the Russians, always beat, like the Soviets always beat the Americans until the moon landing. So the the, the co first cosmonaut who went into space, do you know what he said when he came back yeah, about God? God no, he said, I didn't see God out there. Oh. He said, I didn't see God. Mm. Yeah. 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 Well, because the official, what was the official stance of the Soviet Union? It was atheism, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. That was, that was a sign from God. No more joking around. All right. Uh, then, the vocational term creator, well, this makes sense. It's a term that indicates that God is responsible for all that we see around us, the visible, as well as that which we do not or cannot see, the invisible. Now, in the Nicene Creed, it literally says that. I believe in God the Father, creator of all things, visible and invisible. Right? Now, for ancient peoples, they had a strong sense of there is another realm that we just don't see that still has an impact on us. Now, we would say today, we would say some of that anyways, it's just microscopic stuff that we can't see with our eyes, but it's still there. So a really good example of a microscopic thing that has impacted the world in a huge way in the last five years is what? The COVID virus. Okay, we can't see it, it's so small, right? But it has, it has changed, it has changed civilization. I, I think it quite literally has changed civilization. So that's an example of something that we don't see and yet is real and makes an impact. And that would include you know, any kind of germs and stuff like that. Here's something else that we don't see but has a huge uh, impact on us. And that is we don't see the DNA that we all carry. And yet the DNA that we carry in each cell, you know, has a huge impact on how we, physically anyways, how we grow and develop and function in the world and so on and so forth. Um, and then there are other things like right now, here's an example, there is, there is stuff going on in this room that is invisible and yet if we didn't have that, then none of what we're doing with this would be possible. So what am I talking about? Here. Well, yeah, electricity or Wi-Fi, I was thinking of Wi-Fi signals and stuff like that. You know, like, like you think of how many messages are flying around. You know, be, you know, we've all, not all of us, but most of us have got phones here and they could all ring. We could all get messages at the same time. If that happened, I do think that would be God. Okay. But, but the thing is, is uh, whether it's radio waves or however we want to say, we don't see them and yet they are there. They are real. Well, okay. That question was asked yesterday. Like, so did God create viruses? And the answer would be, well, ultimately, God created the world in which viruses could develop, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and God created the world in such a way that, yes, radio waves could be developed or used, utilized. We could figure out eventually what they are and how to tap into them. You know, but the, the, the components that were necessary for that to happen were put in place already right so electromagnetism has been put in place from the very beginning of earth's existence right but we didn't tap into electromagnetism until the last century and a half right so we can't see angels right and because we can't see them i don't know because i can't see them i don't think about them much but apparently god has always used angels yeah. for everything yeah Christ and after Christ. Yeah. So is that not part of the invisible part that you're yes. unaware of or not seeing? Yeah, and for the ancient people, they would ascribe even more of what was happening to their in their lives to supernatural beings, right? Supernatural meaning literally above nature, right? So super above and nature. 
So it's, it's in a realm that we don't see, but it still impacts us, right? And, um, and so, so yes, the, the, the ancients would absolutely believe that a lot of what was happening to them was because supernatural beings were, were involved. What we would say today is um, not everything has to be described or explained with that, but that doesn't mean that those uh, other beings aren't still there. Uh, one of the terms that I would use now um, to explain the presence of beings like angels that we can't see is that they're, they exist in the, well, I'll put it this way, this is the simplest way I'll put it, they exist in a different dimension than us. Than us. And, then, and so only when God, or when they need to, do they intersect our dimension in a way that, um, Eric. Well, I was just going to say, I remember grade 11 uh, Catholic studies class, we were talking about angels and how they don't really like um, follow the same kind of physics that we do, you know? Yeah. Like they aren't really bound by time, so it matters. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, there's a book, it's actually a trilogy. It's by a Chinese science fiction author. I just read it. There's a, there's a Netflix series coming out about it called The Three, uh, Three Moon something. No, I can't remember the name of the book. Anyways, one of the things that is explored in that is what it means to live with more or fewer dimensions and how that changes everything. But I'll give you one quick example to see if you can kind of get a picture of this. So we got a whiteboard back here. Do I have anything I can write with? No, I do not. So you just have to imagine this. Okay, on a whiteboard, that's a plane, two dimensions, right? It's got height and width, right? But it's got no depth. But imagine that there were beings that lived in that two-dimensional universe, right? And, and so then they, you would have, um, you would have, you know, this person here and this person here, and eventually they could, they could interact with each other, but only in a very limited way. Um, but the problem on this, I don't know if you, you guys on there can kind of see what I'm doing, and I wish I could draw, but I don't know where I have a... Anyways, um, so imagine... Now that there's monsters that also live in this two-dimensional universe. And the monsters will come along silently and then eat up people. And these people don't know where they go. They just know they get eaten up and whatever. And they're really scared and they don't know what to do. But now, one day, one of these people develops the ability to function in three dimensions. And now they can actually step out and they can look and see, oh, I see a monster coming and warns this person, there's a monster coming. This person says, I don't see it. No, I see it. It's coming. And then, you know, the person doesn't live and listen and then gets eaten up and says, well, I told you. But now, okay, so see what's happened is that I've just made something extraordinary by adding one dimension. This person who's now added a third dimension has got abilities that the two-dimensional people can't even imagine, really. Like, uh, so now, let's take this and let's imagine that this is a three-dimensional universe and, and the fourth dimension, which is time, right? Let, imagine you can step out from the three-dimensional universe. Now I can touch the past and the future at the same time, right? You follow? Kind of? All right, so this is, this is something that modern physics have given us insights into, which is there have been things that have been to said in scriptures that we could not explain, but now modern physics is giving us ways of kind of talking about or understanding some of these things. It's like what was once a mystery, how is this possible? Well, multidimensional. So Jesus, after the resurrection, appears and disappears, it seems, at will. Well, how is that possible? Well, maybe because the resurrected body is no longer bound to just the four dimensions that, that we are bound to, but is actually able to function in other dimensions. Okay? So if we live in a world as people did in the old days, where we have no TV, no radio, no cell phones, and all these other things that distract us all day long, <laughs> would we then be more aware of an angel in our life? Were there one I think you, I think what we would be is we'd be more open to that possibility. And there are people today who will who will claim to have seen 
angelic beings, angels, and stuff like that. I, I think that uh, sometimes we don't see some things because we're not looking for them or, or we don't expect them to be there. There's a story, I don't know if it's true, but there's a story that when the first ships from Europe arrived at the, in, the, in the West Indies, so in the Caribbean, that because ships of that type were not even conceivable for those people, that, that all they could see was clouds, but actually it was sails, the sails of the ship. But they couldn't, they couldn't see it, they couldn't see the ship, because they didn't have the frame of reference. So it could also be that we don't have the frame of reference for seeing mm -hmm. things like angels and whatever, whereas ancient people would have been more comfortable with that frame of reference. But if God is the one who's in charge of the angels, yep. we don't need to have anything in order to see one if he wants us to see one. Yeah, and, and so and I can tell you, I've talked with people who have seen angels. I have too, yeah. but I've never seen Yeah, so. I've read things that make you think there must be, this must be real. Yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't deny this. Yeah, well, um, but there's a, there's a choice at a certain point. People can choose to, uh, I'll give you one story, and we got, I got to watch my time here, because I have a place where we got to get to in order to be at the same place as the other group. All right, so this is a story about uh, something happening to somebody that can be interpreted in two different ways. Pastor Bob would tell the story about his grandfather. His grandfather was an atheist. Okay? His grandfather worked in a factory. One day the grandfather was going across the factory floor. It was lunchtime, and uh, the grandfather hears the, a voice call out his name, and he's startled, and he looks up, and he sees a, a piece of metal falling down, and he jumps out of the way, and he's saved. So then, after he catches his breath, he goes to look for the person who warned him, and he could not find anyone. So then he goes into the lunchroom, and he says, which of you guys warned me about the fun? And none of them had warned him. So then the grandfather comes home and tells the story, you know, this is what happened to me today, right? And, and the grandfather couldn't explain it and just said, I don't, I don't know how that happened. But others, including Pastor Bob, would say, well, that was an angel or that was God warning, warning this person. So, so there you go. Same situation can be understood or interpreted in two different ways, depending on the perspective of faith, in, in essence, right? So, so you're saying that maybe I just wanted to see the angel. Well, uh, well in one sense, surely I'm saying that, but, but it's, yeah, it's more complex than that. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. Sorry, it was over here. I was. Uh, I'm just thinking of the effect of prayer. You know, some of those experiments yeah, yeah, where they pray yeah. over patients' charts. The patient doesn't even know. Yeah. And they come out better. It was on a cardiac ward, and they came out better. The ones that God prayed. Yeah. About, and so that a whole effect of prayer and positive thinking. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of stuff I think we do not understand, right? And, uh, and that's why it takes humility, right? Like, like, like we, have to, we have to not fall into the trap of Adam and Eve and say, oh yeah, we know the difference between good and evil. We know, we know what there is to know, right? No, it's, no, we don't know. God knows, so we should be in relationship with God and let God lead and guide us, but... We don't do that very often. All right, I'm going to move on. The creed was written in a precisely structured way to show the full divinity and full humanity of Jesus. And in fact, when you think about the words in the Apostles' Creed, it says nothing about what Jesus taught, nothing about his miracles or what he did, right? It's very basic, and that's because its primary intention was to show the full divinity and full humanity of Jesus. So as with the Nicene Creed, this article was formulated to counteract heresies such as Arianism and Gnosticism. So I'm going to very briefly introduce you to these two heresies. We're going to start with Arianism. So Arianism was a theological doctrine attributed to Arius of Alexandria. Arius taught that Jesus was not fully God, but rather a creation of gods. 
Okay, so maybe a sub God, but but there was God the Creator, and Jesus wasn't there, so Jesus is lesser than, and uh, and and in one level you could sort of think you see how someone could arrive at that conclusion. Like that's not an unreasonable conclusion, and that was one of the things that was debated in Nicaea. That's exactly like was Jesus fully God or was he a creation of God? Or in the terms that they used at Nicaea, was Jesus homo oiseus or homo oiseus? So literally, one iota difference. And the difference is, is he of the same substance of God or is he like the same substance of God? And that's what they were arguing over. And when they, I say they were arguing, they were really arguing. So here's one of my favorite pictures from the Council of Nicaea. This is Bishop Nicholas of Myra slapping Arius of Alexandria at the Council of Nicaea. So who is, who is Bishop Nicholas? Saint Nicholas, Santa Claus. <laughs> Santa Claus is punching out Arius over this heresy. The debate got so heated. And this is, uh, so you know, when we think about, we have debates in the church today and, and sometimes they can get heated too, right? And we think, oh, we've never had to deal with this. No, we've been, had, had heated debates uh, in the church all throughout its history. And, uh, but, but I don't imagine anybody today would get into a heated debate over the, you know, the understanding of the Trinity. Uh, you know, I think they would just go, oh, I don't get it, and they would just shake their heads and walk away. But, but in Nicaea, they were gonna get this worked out. So in the end, the way that they finally decided you know, what was the nature of Christ and what was gonna be included in the creed is they took a vote. It was, a, it was a democratic vote. And the vote was 300 to 3. So 300 said Jesus is God, fully God, and 3, like Arius and a couple of his uh, compatriots, said no, he isn't. So they lost. You know, not, that that, not that that heresy totally disappeared, because it shows up in different ways in different times. But, but, but at least at that point, it was kind of solved. So, so there, there you go. There's the image of theological debate in its extremes. But uh, we got one more, uh, one more heresy to look at, and that's Gnosticism. And this is a little trickier because <coughs> um, it's far more diverse. Uh, Arianism had very, very defined parameters. Gnosticism is very diverse. But generally speaking, Gnosticism taught that the only, only the spiritual realm could be pure and that the physical realm was corrupt, was automatically corrupt. Thus, they concluded that Jesus could not have been truly human, but he only appeared to be human. Because if Jesus was truly human, he was automatically impure. He was automatically corrupt. So what does that mean? It means that if Jesus just appeared to be human, and he wasn't really human, he was just a spiritual being, what could not have happened to Jesus that we say happened to him in the creed? He couldn't have died, just appeared to have died, but he didn't actually die, right? And there's the problem. So Jesus needs both natures because only as God can Jesus have the power to save us, and only as human can Jesus fully relate to us. So prior to this, uh, people could say, well, God doesn't really understand what it's like to be human because God is God. God is up there in the heavens, and God doesn't know what this life is like. But Jesus comes down in the flesh to dwell amongst us, to suffer even to the point of death, so that Jesus, that is God, totally is able to relate to, to what we're going through. Right? So thus, both Jesus' divine and human nature need to be affirmed clearly. And that's what happens in the creed. And so that's where we're going to leave off because next week then what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how the second article of the creed um, clearly shows or what it's attempting to show is the full divinity and full humanity of Jesus and how it does it in a brilliant systematic manner. So how did we do? Perfect. Three minutes for questions. <laughs>
or more. Any questions or comments from anybody on what we've covered today? Some would say branches of Pentecostalism oh. veer into Gnosticism. Um, and then there's certainly what you could say is a lot of uh, New Age stuff oh. would, would, would be sort of like forms of Gnosticism. Oh. So it, it always kind of exists. A any kind of situation where you have people talking about the purity of the spiritual realm and, and that's what we really need to get to and stuff like that, it verges on Gnosticism. Which is not to say that some of those things are, like in so many of these heresies, there's, there's sort of partial truths in them. So I mean, it is true that the spiritual realm is, is pure in a way that, that the physical realm is not. That, I mean, there's a truth to that, right? But that's not the full truth. And, it's not, and it is also negating the fact that God said in the beginning, chapter one of Genesis, creation is good. So, so, you know, it's sort of negating that, and, and you can end up with all kinds of problems with that. Did I tell you about the, the um, Minnesota governor who talked, did I, did I mention that one already? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of, uh, now that wasn't Gnosticism per se, but if we negate the goodness of God's created world, we can end up doing incredible damage. All right, well, let's close with a prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that you have uh, created this world that, that we are so privileged to live in, uh, in spite of the difficulties that we sometimes face in life. We uh, ask that uh, you would be with us in the coming weeks as we continue to work through uh, this creed, that uh, we would come to a deeper uh, faith in you, that we would come to set our hearts towards you in a way that is uh, new and, uh, and uh, meaningful. And I ask that you would keep everyone who is gathered here tonight, either in the room or online, keep them in your care, keep them safe, and keep them in good health. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so there we go. We got through it, in spite of that rough beginning. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, goodbye. Goodbye, everyone.